Wonderful. Wonderful church. Welcome, welcome. My name is Phil, along with uh, my wife Lucy. We and the team just welcome you to C3 London this morning if this is your first time. Uh, huge uh, virtual hugs to you and your family wherever you're tuning in from. It's been such an incredible service. I want to give just a massive shout out to the team that makes this happen every week. Can we, have, can we put a woo, put a woo in the chat? A woo. Fantastic praise and worship every week. Brian leading us, ministering to us this morning. We are so blessed with such an incredible uh, community. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we are about to get around the Word. So why don't you grab out your Bible? Let's not just uh, sit there. Let's let's pull out our Bibles. If you've got paper, if you've got the retro style like Brian had this morning, I love the retro style, but I'm, yeah, I'm uh, on the laptop this morning. But uh, why don't you get ready to receive the word this morning? I'm ex- I'm excited about this word this morning. This is going to be uh, pure and simple, but it is uh, this new series that we're moving into called the Way of Jesus. We have been in a series called Dear London, which has been uh, amazing. It has been about eight weeks long, sharing our heart for our city for the city of London that we would we would write letters that our lives would be letters to this city that we're saying dear London you are loved you are loved by God and that you are loved by us and that we would be a community that exemplifies that our prayer is that around each and every table and each and every household especially at the moment that you would just uh, receive and experience the love of God and that we as a community would exemplify that to you. So that is why we exist. That is why we're here to show the love of God. And so we've been preaching that over the last little while, People, different people sharing their stories. We had an incredible gather night on Wednesday. If you missed that one, like Brian said, the next one is the 4th of November. It's just a night for just added space prayer and worship together. We had everybody up here on the wall projected if you were on the Zoom call, which was really cool. Just felt an engagement uh, and really pray that a, that a seed of hope and faith was imparted in that night for you all as a community. As we navigate what is still a, you know, a tricky season and we wish and we, we do uh, really want to be together and as soon as we can be, we will see what we can do to make that happen. But we also want to be respectful and we want to be responsible and so so the way that we are doing church now will extend uh for the way uh, for the for foreseeable future for 2020 at least uh and so we want to um just keep coming around you keep building community and so church does not exist just on a sunday morning this hour service that would be ridiculous for us to think that that our walk with Jesus is just this hour on a Sunday. And so we have groups on a Wednesday. We have prayer on Friday mornings. We've got the special uh, meet the parents for the families on Saturday morning. But we are the church 24-7. We are, if anything, what this has done is it hasn't limited the church It hasn't paralyzed us. It's actually mobilized us to be the church, to become the scattered church, to become the church across this city. Because the people that you love upon in your workplaces, on the street, your local cafe or restaurant, that is us being the church. And so uh, if we're not limited by it, if we're not limited by it in here, then God is definitely not limited and so we become his hands and his feet to this city. And so this next series is an uh, is exciting one. It's called The Way of Jesus. And so we know that at the moment with so much stuff going around that we wanted to just lay a foundation again for us as a church. Why do we exist? Why do we do what we do? Why, uh, what does it mean to be a Christian? What, does this, what is this faith all about? And so over the next month or so, we're going to be doing this series, The Way of Jesus, just bringing it back to basics. So I'm, uh, I have the privilege this morning of opening up this series. Uh, I'm the appetizer. And then Sebastian Lanazel, who we all love, give a shout out to Seb in the chat. He has an incredible ability to uh, unfold the scriptures and and uh, to teach 
the life and truth that exists within the gospel. And so we're going to unleash Seb for the next four weeks. So he is going to take us, take us on a journey of understanding who Jesus is. What, what, what did Jesus coming to earth, dying and raising again, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us now? What does that mean for us in the future? So we're going to so come at this with a clean slate. Come at it with, leave, leave any preconceptions at the door and let's let God speak to us over the next month as a church. And I believe that if we can get this foundational to who we are as a community, then from that place of security and faith and revelation of what this means, what it means to walk with Jesus will actually revolutionize not, your, not just your individual life or your family, but how we go about loving on our neighbor, how we go about loving on our city. So with that said, let's get into it. So uh, why don't you open up to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. If you were at Gather Night on Wednesday, I shared this scripture. This is one that is going to be foundational to this series. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great a cloud of witnesses. So that therefore is, you ask, what did that come from? So chapter 11 is uh, the stories of the heroes of faith. So it's talking through Abraham and Moses and David and all these people throughout the stories in the Old Testament of our heroes of faith that went before us. They become this great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus everyone say look to Jesus like like Brian said this morning fix our eyes on Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith he started it and he'll perfect it it's not our doing who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is it, church, that we are going to look to Jesus together. In this series, we're going we're gonna to bring our focus in. We're going to bring our attention in. We're going to put Jesus front and center. Because ultimately, this is all about Him. But this is... And what we value so closely is that we do this as a community. We do this together. We search out Jesus together. I love it that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, both in the past, but also now. Our stories, our testimonies, the people that stand to the left and the right of you, we all are uncovering Jesus. We are all pulling together a different part of Him, a different perspective of Him. As you share your testimonies, as you walk with Jesus, you actually start to uh, present and discover a different part of Him that I may not see, that the person next to you may not see. But as we do that together, we uncover what Paul says in Ephesians 3 is the unsearchable riches of Christ, that we would uncover Him together is our prayer. And I love that in Matthew 14, there's this story about Peter walking on water, which is obviously a famous story in the, in the Bible. And if we, jump to, uh, if we jump to verse 26, they're in the middle of a storm and they see Jesus walking on the sea towards them. And it says in verse 26, But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and they said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Verse 28, And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out onto the water. What a totally unnecessary miracle, right? (laughs) Walk on water. But I love that Jesus then says, come. You want to walk on water with me? Come walk on water with me. This is the adventure that we get to go on with Jesus together. This is not a boring life, church. He says, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took him. 
But I love this picture and, and Seb shared this on Wednesday night as well is that that our focus is on Jesus. And it couldn't be any more relevant an analogy at the moment of a storm. We, f- we feel like there's winds coming from all directions, health or politics or w- whatever it is that are creating this storm in us currently. But I love that this points towards the fact that our he walked on water. He did the miraculous. He walked this adventure with Jesus. And it's when he lost sight of Jesus, when he started looking at the circumstances around him, that he started to sink. But regardless, Jesus was there to grab him. But for us, it becomes about fixing our eyes on Jesus. There's another famous story about them being out on a boat and a storm and Jesus is asleep in the boat. And they're worrying, they're losing it. Because this, they're fishermen, they're mature fishermen, but this storm is scaring the, scaring the life out of them. And Jesus is resting. And it's the same thing. That if, if Jesus is in our boat, if Jesus is with us, if Jesus is at rest, we can be at rest. If Jesus is at peace, we can be at peace. And I love the way that Hebrews 12 ends is that he says that... Um, And he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What Jesus came to do is done. It's finished, completed. There is nothing left for him to do. He's now seated at peace, resting, laid back. What he came to do is done. And so for us now, it is just focusing on Jesus. So as a church, we're going to look to Jesus because he is our foundation. When you're, they tell you when you're, when you're in a boat, if you're getting seasick, to look at the horizon. You look at a point of stability. When you're navigating at sea, you look at the North Star because that is constant. It doesn't move. Hebrews 13 tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what that means is this cloud of witnesses. What God did for them, He will do for us. The miracles, signs, wonders, walking beside them, walking with them, that same God, these miraculous stories that we read throughout Scripture is the same God that we have with us right now in 2020 amongst a global pandemic. He is not worried. He is not scared. He is not afraid. He is at peace. He is at rest. And so because He is, we can be as well helps us set our perspective high. We get tired, we get frustrated. Scripture says that, uh, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. At the moment, with everything going on, false summit after false summit, we think it's the peak, we think we're almost there, and then it's not. We think it is, and then it's not. That leaves us deflated, frustrated. But I'm believing that as a church that we would have hope like Jesus, the joy set before him, a hope as an anchor, that sea analogy, an anchor to our soul would guide us and would be our security. So C.S. Lewis says, I believe in Christianity as I believe in that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Our faith in Jesus gives us a new set of glasses to see life through. And as a church, in the darkest times, we can be the light. In times of despair and pain, we can be hope and joy. I said to the team this morning, I've been challenged this week even with my conversations. You can get trapped in having the conversations that leave you feeling more anxious. Because we get wrapped up in it all. The circumstances surrounding us, we let the winds stir us up. Instead of looking to Jesus, instead of looking to see that he's actually asleep in the boat, he's not worried. He's out walking on the water. He's not worried by the wind and the waves. He's cruising on it. And so can we. And so it's those conversations that we're having with our colleagues, with our friends, with our family. It's fine to lament. It's fine that this is hard. But let's be a community of faith that leaves people with a sense of joy leaves people with a sense of hope. So the first question in this series then becomes, what does it mean to be a Christian? And the simple answer is Jesus. 
If you've been to Bible college, the answer to every question, Jesus. One name, one person. It's not the religion of Christianity, it's the person of Jesus. We are called to be followers of Jesus. So the question then is, what does it mean to follow? And basically in our modern language, it means to apprentice, to apprentice Jesus. That we would be with Jesus, become like him, and do what he did. This picture of Jesus in first century Judaism was a rabbi. He was a teacher. And he would call people, call men, young men unto himself and say, follow me, come follow me. And there's an example of this in Mark 8 and verse 27. I'll just read this chunk of scripture here. It says, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea, Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others say the, one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man, Jesus, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Rebuking Jesus, good start. But turning and seeing his disciples... Jesus stops mid-rebuke with Peter, turns to his disciples. Time out. You all come in while I chastise Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. So this series, let's make a recommitment to follow Jesus. If he has become peripheral, if it's become about something else. I love that Jesus in this moment, he's kind of saying to them, look, if you've come to me for any other reason, just before this, he's fed 5,000. He's done all. If you've come to me for any other reason than just following me, you're going to be disappointed. We come to Jesus and we think that everything's going to be rosy. Everything's going to be. James 1 says that to consider it all joy when you face trials. It's not an if, it's a when. So this stuff happening around us does not mean that God doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. Ultimately, Jesus' death and resurrection was the ultimate act of love. So we can't look at anything bad that happens around us and say that God doesn't love us because he's already done it. The ultimate act of love is already done. And we live around this stuff. And so it can form doubts and contradictions in our mind. But ultimately, the work has been done. Jesus is Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he becomes our focus, if we follow him, he will lead us to the other side of the storm. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's in Matthew 4. When we follow Jesus, change in us is inevitable. You want him to grow? Just follow Jesus. You don't have to look at everything else. Focus on Jesus and let him do that transformation on the inside of you. It says, come, follow me. It's the language of, a, of our rabbi. A rabbi had a yoke. And a yoke was their teaching. It was their interpretation of the Torah. It's how they see the world. It's their worldview of what God meant and what, this, what it means to be part of his world, part of his kingdom. And uh, that gives, it gives new meaning to Matthew 11 when Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
Jesus teaches us to do life. So we are followers of Jesus. The, the original Christians were called followers of the way. Why? Because this faith is a journey. This faith is a journey that we are all on. I am on it. You are on it. We are discovering Jesus along the way. We are walking the dusty paths with our Messiah in 2020 like they did in 1 AD. Followers of the way. And so Jesus is on the journey with us, but Jesus is also our destination. the core of our faith, our faith in the moment and our faith in the future is Jesus Christ. He wants to give us life now, not just in eternity, now. He didn't do all he did just so that we could sit around and wait to die and go to heaven. That's morbid. As exciting as heaven seems, what's, what's the rest of my 80 years on this planet for? He's come to give me life now. He's come to give you life now, give you joy now, give you hope now. So it's about experiencing Him. There's a story in Matthew 8, verse 23. And this is, this is the, when Jesus is asleep on the boat. And verse, uh, so he, he says, uh, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And Jesus awoke and He said to them, why are you afraid? You have little faith. Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And they marveled at him, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? This is the Jesus we serve. This is the Jesus we follow. He's not just a nice guy. He's not just a moral man. He is the Son of God. He has authority. All authority is given to me on hev in heaven and on earth, at Jesus' word. So we are called to be in relationship with the creator of the universe. The more you get to know Jesus, the more you want to know Jesus. I promise you that. So as a, a, in this series, we are going to dive into what this means. The best thing about being a Christian is Christ. The best thing about Jesus is Jesus. Nothing else. We don't worship an ideal, we worship God. We don't worship a philosophy or a good idea. We worship the God of the universe who came as a man, as Jesus, to show us the Father, to show us the love of God. So Paul goes on in Philippians 3.8 to say, Indeed, I count everything else as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That Jesus is our life pursuit. And interestingly, when you make Jesus your life pursuit, side note, people become your life pursuit. Why? Because the heart of God is people. The heart of God is His sons and daughters who fill the earth, that all would come to the knowledge of Him. History proves that Jesus exists. That is not a question. There's more proof for Jesus than many other famous historical characters, people. So that's not a question. He's a real man that walked the earth. His blood, his DNA is still in the soil around Israel and Galilee. So the question becomes, who do you say that I am? That is Jesus' question to you and I. Who do you say that I am? You may be watching church for the first time. You may not have ever seen anything like this. Jesus is asking you that question. Who do you say that I am? He existed. He, was, he is real. That is proven. So who do you say that I am? And for those of us who have been in church for a long time, he's asking you that question again. Who do you say that I am? That is the most important question you can answer in life. Who do you say that Jesus is? And for me, God is not a question. I've been raised in a, in a Christian family, but that doesn't mean that faith came to me 
instantly and naturally. It's a choice. Faith is a choice, but faith is also a gift that we receive when we take that step, when we, take, when we make that choice, that it rises inside of us, that He is the author and perfecter of our faith, that faith comes through the Holy Spirit. When you reach out to God, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Let, draw near and let Him show Himself to you. The universe is not based on chance. The the foundation of the universe is love because God is love. He created the universe. Whether it's billions of years old or thousands of years old, it doesn't matter because God is the essence of it all. It wasn't chance. It's not mathematics. It's love. And we are designed for relationship with Him. Like Brian said earlier, the Bible calls him Emmanuel, God with us. Colossians 1 says that he is, the in, he is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1 says that he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, that he upholds the universe with all its power. Jesus is saying, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He's not just introducing himself to us. Jesus is, God, is how God made himself accessible to us. He shows us God's nature, but it was all about bringing the Father, the Father wanting to come close to us. This is why Jesus is not a religion. Because a religion will tell you of what you have to do to achieve your ultimate goal or your end result. Stuff that you have to do in order to get somewhere. And the sad thing is, is that some of us believe in God, but we think that He's hijacked life. And so now we have to pay back a certain amount for me to get life. It's not even that you don't believe in God, you just haven't got the right picture of Him. And that's why Jesus came as flesh and blood. That we would know the Father. That we would know God. So Jesus can't be seen in the same light as religion because he did the exact opposite. It's not about man getting to God. This is the story of God coming to man, God coming to earth as flesh and blood so that we could know him. All religions aren't the same. If every religious construct is about how we can achieve enlightenment, heaven, salvation, nirvana, Jesus flips that on its head. Jesus came to show us what God would do to get to us. I heard one preacher say that God is the name we use when we talk about man getting to God, but Jesus is the name we use when we talk about God coming to us. Jesus is the name we use when we talk about God searching for us. So as I close with the worship band come back up. John 14, verse 1 to 7. This is Jesus making a huge and massive statement. Let your hearts, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be. And you know that the way you know where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said this massive statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. It's an exclusive claim. And Jesus isn't apologetic about it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want to know God? He's come to you. He is the way to the Father. We are built for the future. We dream, we imagine. And He is that way forward for us. He's the truth because He characterizes, He is the characterization of God's nature. 
He is the embodiment of truth. We are all searching for meaning. And He is the truth we can trust. He is stable. He is secure. He is the life. We're all searching for life at the end of the day. We're all searching for life. And we look to find it in so many different things. But at the end of the day, if you're living your most fulfilled, happy, joyous life, it's not when you've got things. It's when you've found love. And that's what Jesus came to do for us. To become truly alive. So why Jesus? Because He is our why. He is He's our meaning. I heard a speaker say once that you're, you may not believe in God, but man, your soul misses Him. There is, it's like a hand and glove. That our souls fit into the nature of God. Our souls are made to be in relationship with God. He is good news. He's not good advice. It's been done. It's finished. That we are free. We are loved because of who Jesus is. Because He came to show us the Father. So we worship Him. What does following Jesus look like? Prayer life. Cast your burdens upon Him. Daily being in relationship with Him. Casting your cares, your weights, those concerns, those sins, those things that so easily cling to us. Like I said in Hebrews 12, we would look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. It is not what we do or what we don't do, but He has come already. He's done it already. He's shown us the Father, and so we can be in relationship with him. So this morning you might want to uh, pray that prayer for the first time. And so our welcome team is there to pray with you. Why don't you engage in the chat there if you want to know more about Jesus? They're happy to pray with you and talk with you. And tune in over the next month as we dive deep into what this means. What does it mean to be in relationship with God? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Who is this man that revolutionized and changed the world forever? Focus on Him. Focus on becoming like Him. Focus on becoming all who He's called you to be, the relationship that He has for you. And so we're going to sing another worship song to finish. And as we do that, let me just read just this list of all that Jesus is to us. Jesus reveals God to us. He's the bearer of salvation. He redeems our life. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. He's Lord. He's Savior. He is God. He is the Messiah. He is Jesus Christ. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the Son of God. He has all authority. He is love. He is perfect. He is our great reward. He is incapable of evil. He is grace. He is salvation. The way, the truth, and the life. The only name that saves. He is Emmanuel, God with us. The Prince of Peace. He has conquered sin and death. He has overcome the cross and the grave. He is our healer. He is our redeemer. He is our first love. He is the cornerstone and our very perfect focus, the rock on which we stand, the creator of the universe, eternal, forever, everlasting, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never leaves us or forsakes us. He is worth living for. He is worth dying for. He sets us free. By His blood, we have been forgiven and washed clean, cleansed of all unrighteousness. His death redeems us, restores us, renews us. He's purchased us, seals us, and covers us. His life made a way for us. His life set an example for us. He is all you need. He is Jesus. Let's focus on Jesus, church. Let's worship together.